All right, I see that attendee number stabilizing a little bit. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone. We'll get started at, for tonight's um, February 2022 Pop-Up University. Um, Pop-Up University is a collaborative effort between IUSB and LangLab, and we are looking to extend conversations that I think often are experienced only in classrooms to a wider South Bend community. Um, for today's session, if you want to use the chat to ask any technical questions, if you're having any technical issues, can't hear, et cetera, please use the chat for that. Otherwise, we encourage you to use the Q&A module to, um, to ask questions throughout uh, the presentation today. Um, and at the end, we will have a dedicated um, 15 minutes or 20 minutes to go through those questions and have a conversation. All right, this month we are just incredibly lucky, lucky to have uh, Dr. Heller, Daryl Heller here um, as our featured speaker. He's gonna be speaking to us tonight about the ways in which we might look more critically at how race is embedded in our history and how that knowledge helps to make sense of many of the issues that I think we are struggling with today in, the, in our society. But before we start, we um, need to acknowledge our driving forces behind the event. Um, Dr. Gail McGuire, who's on, um, leads the IU South Bend Community Engagement Efforts, and IU South Bend Center for Excellence in Research and Scholarship is led by Dr. Josh Wells. If you've attended any of our previous Pop-Up University events, you'll note that Josh is not leading us as usual tonight. You're stuck with me. Um, I'm Stephanie Risk. I own and operate LangLab South Bend, um, which is entering its 11th year of uh, bringing events like this to our community. And I am also an IUSB alumni. So um, I earned an undergraduate degree in sociology many, many years ago. So this is a partnership that we truly enjoy. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, including Indiana Humanities, as well as many different um, additional departments and offices across IU South Bend. As you can see from the list, um, we have been able to bring a wide range of research and conversation through this series into the community. And um, along with our sponsors, I think we would expect to continue to do this far into the future. So thanks again. All right, well, you didn't come here tonight to hear me, so um, I am going to hand off the rest of our hour to Dr. Daryl Heller. Dr. Heller has a lengthy history of raising up the communities around him and has a range of experience working in the fields of human services, community development, and political activism. He has studied at both Columbia University and the University of Chicago and also co-founded the Amistad Institute, a nonprofit organization with the mission to design, develop, and implement educational programs for inner city communities. We've been incredibly lucky to have Dr. Heller working here in South Bend since 2015. He is a powerful organizer and an activist, and as the director of the Civil Rights Heritage Center, he has transformed it into a vibrant hub for activity in the areas of fighting for civil rights and social justice. And as an assistant professor of women's and gender studies, he also teaches and facilitates discussions on difficult topics, such as the history of racism and white supremacy, race construction and the intersection of race and gender. So I am going to stop my share and Dale, yep, perfect. You should be on. Am I on? Yep, you're on. So you All can right. go ahead and share your slides and get us get us rolling. Thank you All very right. much. Um, thank you, Stephanie. And I particularly want to thank um, Dr. Guillaume McGuire and the Community Engagement Center for giving me the opportunity to speak with everyone tonight on this wintry, blustery, you know, everybody glad we're at home night. Um, what I wanted to share tonight is something I've been thinking about a lot and working on, and this kind of intersects 
um, probably with what many of you have heard me talk about at different times and in different venues. Um, but I'm working on a way of thinking about history and particularly history as it can intersect with critical race theory um, and how we how we can understand race and um, the, 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 the divisions that we're experiencing today. How can we put that into a historical frame? Um, so given that I'm working this out a little bit, I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, so, but I'm gonna read most of what I have um, because that way I can kind of keep track of what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate. But before I, I start that, given the topic, um, I want to um, give an acknowledgement. I think it's important that we acknowledge that the first harms inflicted on the formation of this nation was on the various groupings of indigenous people who occupied this land long before Europeans even knew it existed. Thus, we must acknowledge that we are standing on stolen land. What we call Indiana is the, is the traditional homeland of the Miami, the Wea, the Piankashaw, the Shawnee, the Eel River, the Delaware, the Potawatomi, the Kickapoo, the Odawa, the Chippewa, the Wyandot, the Kaskaskia, Mashikin, Nanticoke, the Huron, the Mohegan, and others. We mourn the many deaths that resulted from their forced removal, as well as honor their spirit that remains in the soil, the trees, the rocks and rivers, and importantly, within the people who are still here because they are not all gone. So that said, and kind of framing um, what I wanna talk about, I wanna start this, this discussion with a statement that some will find provocative and others will find fairly trivial, which is that this nation was founded on and maintained by a worldview, an ideological perspective, and a set of ethics that is grounded in white supremacy. I don't mean anything fancy by this term. Merriam Webster defines, Merriam Webster gives a good enough definition which defines white supremacy in two parts. One, it is the belief that the white race is inherently superior to other races and that white people should have control over people of other races. That's complemented by uh, a belief, or an, actually more than the belief, an activity that engages the social, economic, and political systems that collectively enable white people to maintain power over people of other races. Importantly, white supremacy is not simply a set of abstract beliefs, but operates in the world through social, economic, political, and political systems that enable white people to maintain power over non-white people. And the operative word in all of that is power. Now, what I mean by white is also fairly straightforward. It's simply the common sense view that anyone who is white presenting can back up their claims to whiteness by a loose genealogy that traces their ancestry back to Europe and is accepted as white by other white people, that person is white. But since race is a social construct that has no biological or scientific basis, the last criteria, that of being accepted by white people, especially other white people with power, is particularly significant. And by extension, anyone, someone who is non-white who doesn't meet any of those criteria. Now, one of the issues with whiteness is that it's largely invisible, if that's by design. There are many reasons for this, including that one of the powers and privileges of white supremacy is that in racializing non-white others, whiteness becomes a naturalized, unrace measuring rod by which all others are judged and generally found to be inferior. This invisibility of whiteness is one of the reasons that discussions of white supremacy is such a difficult topic to address today. 
while many people may acknowledge that there are individuals who believe in white supremacy, and all we have to do is think of the McDaniels who are on trial in Atlanta now for the murder of Ahmaud Arbery. But these folks who believe that they'll attribute a belief in white supremacy, but these same folks will deny the second part of Miriam of Miriam Webster's definition, which is that whiteness will deny that it, that whiteness exists in any kind of structural or systemic way. In other words, many people believe that white supremacy can exist within irrational individuals, or at the worst, at the very worst, within aberrant groups yet maintain that the fundamental systems and institutions that compose our society, particularly our political system of liberal democracy and our economic system of capitalism is essentially fair and colorblind. And that's the view I wanna challenge. And this is the view I wanna challenge from a perspective of critical race history and hopefully draw a thread from its origins to where we are today. So let me start by saying a few words about history, both as a discipline and as a practice. Haitian scholar and anthropologist, Michel Rolf Truyot wrote in his book, Silencing the Past, The Power and Production of History, that, and in, in the quotes, he wrote that in vernacular use, History means both the facts of the matter and a narrative of those facts, both what happened and that which is said to have happened. The first meaning places the emphasis on the socio historical process, the second on our knowledge of that process or on a story about that process. In other words, from this perspective, history is a dance between facts that is events, occurrences, or activities that happen within a specific time and context, and what is written or said to shape our understanding and acceptance of those facts. The facts, that is what happened, while perhaps contested, occupy a rather fixed historical moment. Narratives, on the other hand, are more fluid and dynamic, changing, depending on who was narrating, the historical moment in which the narration is delivered, and the socially embedded position of the narrator. Now, in order to be accurate, the historical narrative must adhere closely to the facts and detail as fully and honestly as possible the context as well as the content of what happened. W.E.B. Du Bois, Made an, made an important observation that we're wise to heed. In his 1935 monograph, Black Reconstruction in America, Du Bois noted that, and this is a long quote, but I think it's important that we, we, we go through it all. Du Bois wrote that if history is going to be scientific, if the record of human action is going to be set down with that accuracy and faithfulness of detail, which will allow its use as a measuring rod and guidepost for the future of nations, there must be some standards of ethics in research and in an interpretation. If, on the other hand, we're going to use history for our pleasure and amusement, for inflating our national ego and giving us a false but pleasurable sense of accomplishment, then we must give up the idea of history either as a science or as in art, using the results of science, and frankly admit that we are using a version of historical fact, of historic fact in order to influence and educate the new generation along the way that we wish. It is propaganda like this that has led men in the past to insist that history is lies agreed upon and to point out the danger to, in such misinformation. It is in, it is indeed extremely doubtful if any permanent benefit comes to the world through such action. Nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And we shall not 
and we shall not best guide humanity by telling the truth. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all of this as far as the truth is ascertainable? That is, those are wise words. And what I'd like to do with the rest of my time is share some thoughts about how our narrative of American history that doesn't acknowledge the fundamentality of white supremacy has veered toward propaganda rather than history. To the extent that it is omitted, that is white supremacy. The story that we tell ourselves, or more accurately, the stories that are told to us, is a narrative constructed more for inflating our national ego and giving us a false but pleasurable sense of accomplishment than setting out, setting down with accuracy and faithfulness of detail a history that allows us to learn from the past so that we can have a future that truly does live up to our, to our ideals. So what is this traditional narrative um, that we're so fond of repeating? It runs something like this. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America. Notwithstanding the fact that there were people already here who needed no discovering, Columbus brought the civilizing culture of Europe to the savage and heathen Indians, who in turn were awed by the pale explorers and recognized the superiority of these benevolent newcomers. As this new world was being carved up by European powers, England laid claim to what became known as British North America, the present day United States. Colonists arrived to establish permanent settlement, settlements, most notably the pilgrims, whose greatest gift to us is Thanksgiving. Growing dissatisfied with the tyranny of England led the brave and scrappy colonists to declare their independence and in the process, Presenting, the world, presenting to the world the bold and inspirational statement that all men are created equal with inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Revolutionary War was thus a war for freedom and liberty, whose successful outcome culminated in the drafting of the Constitution, that, that great document that laid the foundation of a new nation. America, we are told, was not perfect and stumbled on the issue of slavery. Not much more needs to be said about that because, because after a bloody civil war, we were back on track. To the extent that we fell short, that we still fell short of the exalted ideals of, ideals of our founding, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement made the necessary correctives and we now live truly in a colorblind society in which justice is blind, the rule of law is applied equally, and opportunities are available to all based on merit, as it should be. Now, obviously, that's much oversimplified. But in truth, the gist of that narrative is certainly what I was taught about American history, and actually how I thought about American history before graduate school. This grand narrative, as it is, such that it is, is exemplified in the 1872 painting, American Progress by John Gast, which, uh, which is often described as a great representation of manifest destiny. The idea that the United States is destined by God nonetheless, to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. And what we see here, and I just wanna take a minute and just point out a couple of symbols that kind of embody this narrative. We see in the center um, what the figure known as Columbia, which represents America. Um, she's holding a book and, the, and the, on the book is a written school book to represent education. And she's moving forward and, and in her wake, um, at her back, we see the East Coast and the bridges and ships and commerce that made the East Coast this, this bountiful um, part of America. And as she moves westward, 
along, she drags along telegraph wires representing communication. The transcontinent, transcontinental railroad was being constructed and all of the technology. Settlers in stagecoaches and wagon trains, as well as settlers here um, who were already kind of occupying part of the Midwest. In, at her front, which is still dark because it hasn't yet had the light of uh, good white civilization, we see the fleeing indigenous people and the wild animals in the wilderness. Um, we see the Rockies represented here and at the very top edge there, the Pacific Ocean to which she's headed. Um, this painting um, embodies that narrative of sorts that I learned. Um, but I wanna present a different version of this narrative that shifts the focus from a triumphant and linear march of progress, of progressive advancement. And I wanna argue that the ground upon which the United States was founded was not liberty and justice, but was white supremacy and white privilege and power. Many people claim that slavery was the nation's original sin. However, my claim is that America's original sin was the ideology that made racialized slavery a fundamental part of the nation's founding, enrichment, and advancement. After all, white supremacy, which gave birth to slavery, also outlived that terrible institution and replaced it with other institutions that has ensured its continued survival. Furthermore, I will assert, but I won't argue here unless, and, but I'll talk about it if anyone would like to. I wanna, I, without arguing, I, I will claim that progress is nonlinear. It doesn't happen in a straight line and is also provisional. It, it's not guaranteed that once in place, it always remains in place. Just by example, the first two decades of the 21st century has witnessed the election of the first black president right alongside the regression in voting rights and the regression in women's reproductive choices and much more, all of which are on the brink of being dismantled you know, in our very moment. So while there's many ways to approach the history of this country, I wanna talk briefly about the founding of the nation and re-examine the context in which the institutions of government were laid. I wanna challenge the boast that we live in the longest surviving democracy in history and perhaps generate a way to a more useful narrative. This is a famous painting depicting many of the um, signers of the Declaration of Independence. The first thing that we notice, unsurprisingly, is that all of the people in this, in this picture are elite white men. That is, men of property and means. What is less obvious in this image, though again, unsurprisingly, is that the vast majority of these men were slave owners. In fact, of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 41 owned black bodies as property. Of the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Congress in 1787, almost half were slave owners. The Constitutional Convention, which lasted five months, was filled with debates, with arguments, with blustering and compromises. The final product though, was our revered constitution, which began with the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. Notice the universalist language highlighted by the opening phrase, we the people. But that should make, every, that should make everyone pause. Who exactly are they referring to by this 
we. And when they wrote that the purpose behind forming a more perfect union was to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, upon whom were those blessings to be bestowed? These are not trite questions, but are at the very heart of engaging in a critical race history. Historian David Wallstriker noted that, the that, that of the Constitution's 84 clauses, six are directly concerned with slaves and their owners, and in the additional five other clauses are, had implications for slavery. These components of the Constitution included the infamous three-fifth clause, which allowed for three-fifths of the number of slaves in any state to count towards representation in Congress. Other references to slavery were the, fugi the fugitive from labor clause, the militia clause, and the 20-year extension of the Atlantic slave trade. Although the Constitution never mentions the word slave, it legitimized the labor regime and created a non-white class of people fully outside of its protections, privileges, and rights. In other words, we the people, despite the narrative that we are told, did not include all people. It only included white people, which philosopher Charles Mills described as a white racial contract. And importantly to note that the signing of the document did not even intend to include all white people to the same degree of, with the same degree of freedom and rights. For example, propertyless white men were not allowed to vote and white women were excluded from the public sphere, denied political personhood altogether and were dependent on white male paternalism. Notably, Virginia, in the, in the signing of the, of the Constitution and its writing, Virginia, was the, Virginia, as the most populous and wealthy state in, its, in this early national period, produced some of the key individuals who were at the forefront of the nation's founding. It was home to George Washington, who as a kid, I was told, chopped down a cherry tree, crossed the Delaware, crossed the Delaware and became the father of our country. What I wasn't told was that Washington was also a wealthy slave owner, keeping over 120 people in bondage. In fact, the compromises made to accommodate slavery in the Constitution made it possible for four of the first six presidents to be Virginia slave owners. Altogether, 12 of the first 18 presidents Two thirds owned slaves as, at some point in their lives, and eight of these presidents owned slaves while serving in office. And the government that they bestowed upon us that we've inherited is a federal democratic republic. It has three branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial, which serves as a set of checks and balances to ensure that no single branch could dominate. For the vast majority of the history of this country, all three branches were occupied by wealthy white men, most, if not all, who held firm to the ideology of white supremacy. This lens shaped all that came under it. Even Northerners who argued vociferously against slavery, with very few exceptions, were unconflicted about the superiority of whiteness. This means that most of the people in power believe that people of African descent were inferior to whites and could legitimately be denied access to basic rights and protections. The Washington Post did a recent research study in which they found that 1,795 slaveholders once served in the US Congress. Additionally, Several Supreme Court justices were slave owners, including John Marshall, considered by many to be one of the greatest legal minds this country has ever produced. None of this includes or considers state and local office holders, both North and South, 
who believed in and perpetuated white supremacy over the centuries. My point is that given the pervasiveness and depth of white supremacy in shaping the character of this country, especially as, as manifest in the halls of power, it should come as no surprise that it continues to live today in our structures, institutions, and systems of domination. How could it not? No Black person served in the US Congress until 1870. And to date, there have only been 11 Black senators, all but two of them elected in my lifetime. There have only been two Black Supreme Court justices, and one has been extremely hostile to the, to the dismantling the struct of the structures that prop up oppression. There's only been one black president and he faced a predominantly white Congress who worked overtime to thwart most of his policies. What that means is that the checks and balances of the government have failed to make this a more perfect union. What we have had for much of the history of this country is a legislative branch that generally has either made laws that objectively affected non-white people unequally or fail to advance laws that would equalize and protect the rights of everyone. These laws have been interpreted by a judicial branch that has mostly been occupied by men whose experience and ideology lead them to either protect the status quo or narrow the meaning of laws to create space for white supremacy to flourish. And outside of a few brief flashes in the 1950s and 1960s, these laws were enforced by an, by an executive branch that has refused to expend any political capital challenging white supremacy. A country that prides itself on being a nation, of being a bastion of liberty and governed by the rule of law has never passed legislation condemning lynching or the lynching and the extrajudicial murder of black people. A country that boasts that it is a nation of immigrants imposes restrictive immigration policies to limit or deny entry to non-white people from Asia, Haiti, and places south of the US border. And courts that claim to stand for equality and justice has so far refused to recognize the particular needs of women of color who must navigate the twin oppressions of racism and sexism. This is all to say that if we're going to fully embrace who we are as a nation and society, we have to engage in a study of critical race history and own the steel rod of white supremacy that runs through the nation's backbone. And I believe we have to own it before we can change it. Thank you. So that's what I have to say. Um, and I am open to and looking forward to discussion and conversation with others. Yes, thank you, Dr. Harrell. Um, so if, if you have a, a question uh, for Dr. Harrell, you can put it uh, in the Q&A and then I would be um, happy to read those to him. We'll give, give people uh, 30 seconds or so to do that. I do see just a comment in that. It's interesting that Lincoln's vice president was a slave owner. Um, yeah, Andrew Johnson, who was also, he then became president um, after Lincoln was assassinated and was one of the um, most racist um, people, persons in the, in the administration or in our government at the time, um, vetoed every civil rights act um, that came up before him um, from Congress and believed very ardently in black inferiority and white supremacy. So uh, Daryl, uh, Stephen Brenser put a comment and a question in the chat. He said, okay. can you address the 1619 project and its reception? Um, sure, I, I think of the 1619 project as a great example of critical race history. Um, and I think the reception of it 
you know, there's been two, you know, there's been received, I think, of two minds. One is, you know, folks, some folks have embraced it as like, finally, somebody is kind of writing a history. And, you know, um, Nicole Hannah Jones, you know, is, is not a, she's not a professional historian, she's a journalist, but she really used the tools of history um, and talked to a lot of historians to really excavate the story that she tells in the 1619 project. The other side, um, the other perspectives with the 1619 project, um, I think are those who are outraged by it because it destabilizes the, that narrative that I told that I learned as a kid, it really kind of challenges that, um, you know, and kind of exposes, I would say the warts um, that are part of American's his, American history. And so that, re that reception the, on, the, on the more the critical or outrage side of it, I think are mainly from those who want to hold on to that warm, fuzzy narrative. Um, you know, kind of as Du Bois said, uh, that kind of sense of self-righteousness and accomplishment, but really has not much to do with the full narrative of American history. It's much more about what, what can make us feel good and anything that, um, kind of intersects that becomes something to attack, which is similar, you know, we see it similarly with the attacks on critical race theory um, and the efforts around the country in different school districts to control the kind of curriculum or information that can be taught in schools about history or social studies. Um, so I, I think it's incumbent on us um, who really actually do care about this country and care about history to really continue to push back um, and we can fold. The, the, the narrative I talk about with critical race theory really focusing on people of African descent, they, it can be a powerful critical race history and a critical indigenous racial history can also be told. I mean, that history is also one that has been severely suppressed um, because again, it destabilizes that, um, triumph, that triumphant march of progress narrative. A few people um, have commented in the Q&A about what's happening in Indiana right now regarding what teachers can and uh, cannot teach about yes. race. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Your thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of along the same lines that um, the effort to, you know, it, it, I, I personally feel somewhat outraged almost that they're trying, that with folks trying to suppress that history, on, uh, and I feel outraged for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, there's a kind of, um, at best, I mean, if I'm gracious, you know, this the, a kind of blind spot that those critics of teaching racial the history of race, um, especially those that claim that they don't want to make little white kids feel uncomfortable or you know go home you know and, and ask uncomfortable questions of their parents. Um, you know, that, 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 that same level of sensitivity wasn't ever expressed when the omission of the history of people of color um, who never found people who looked like them and were made to feel like they had no, made no accomplish, accomplishments in this country. And, and, and I think my other level of outrage is that I think it harms all kids to not know this history. Um, I think it doesn't prepare white kids to be equipped to deal with diversity and the growing diversity, both in our state, in our, in our country, and as the world continues to become more global. I mean, if we don't, we don't teach diversity, if we don't um, introduce young people, particularly to um, other perspectives, other viewpoints, and teach them and teach all of us to be critical thinkers, then I don't think that we're doing our um, our due diligence. I don't think that we're we're actually fulfilling the responsibility that we have as adults to our young people to to prepare them for the world that that they're going to inherit. We have so many great questions here. Um, here's a, a question: How can we convince those who oppose um, such history, this teaching of uh, critical? A race history, how can we convince them that this is important and relevant? Um, that, that's, oh, that's a big $64 question, right? 
And what I've come to is we can't. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that cynically at all. Um, but I think that if people, people have to be, have to be open. Um, and what I've learned, you know, over many years of having these difficult conversations, that if someone's not opening to hearing something different or hearing another perspective, you can't convince them. Um, and at best, one of the ways, and, and I think this is true, for example, I've had numerous conversations of, you know, talking to people about those who choose not to get vaccinated and what the reason for it. Like people make up their minds and they ultimately will dig their heels in. And the folks that they will listen to is not me. Um, I can't convince somebody I don't know if they've already made their mind, who can convince them as people that are close to them. Um, and so, you know, we often say that the people that you can have the most control of is those folks that sit around your Thanksgiving table. Those are your relatives, your friends, your um, family members. You know, that you have a better shot of talking to them than to a stranger. Um, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to, to do that, to have those conversations, particularly within our circles. Um, and we all have people in our circles that um, hold that opposing view. And I think to continue to have dialogues with them to the extent that they will. But I don't think, you know, most of them will not be open. I mean, I, I've found to being convinced otherwise. Um, it's, it's, it's a conundrum. Uh, we have another question about, do you think um, we should also have a field of study called critical race economics? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I don't know who asked that, but I certainly be willing to talk about that because I think if we look at the, you know, critical race theory really kind of, critical race theory, you know, really looks at the law and how the, how the law as a structure and institution, how racism is embedded in it. And I think we could do the same with our economic structure. I think capitalism, if, if, if I'm reading your question, um, you know, how that's been used. And, and I think that critical, and I would actually call it more of a critical class economics, because I think that um, the way the structure of our economic system has worked has been to oppress all poor people. Um, and, and, and when you couple that with race, what it has done is keep poor black, black people and poor white people from organizing together. And I think that looking at that history is, is important. And something that I thought I've been thinking about is that to, to, to have the conversations with white folks and particularly working class white folks is, is not so much, in my opinion, to talk with, to them about race or the history of race, um, I'm also a labor historian. I've, I've done a lot, a lot of my work and research around late 19th century labor history. And it's pretty, it's pretty atrocious, you know, the, the oppression to just workers, to just ordinary folks who are trying to make a living and how the state apparatus through corporate support has continued over and over and over again to suppress the aspirations. Um, it's, it's not a mystery and it's part of the unwrapping that history is understanding why we don't have stronger labor unions in this country. Why do we have so many right to work states? That's really not in the interest of workers. Um, but that's been something that has been kind of programmed over decades and centuries. So yes, a critical economic history. I'm down with that. <sighs> Um, and we have a, a, another question. Um, what implications does this shift in historical perspective have as we consider white responsibility for addressing persistent white supremacy now? What might this look like in our community? Um, I think in our community, our local community, because I, I do believe that change actually happens locally in, in its most significant ways. Um, one of the most important things I think people can should and should be doing is continuing to educate themselves and having conversations with one another. Um, we have to be politically active. Um, we have to speak up and not be silent. Um, you know, I think, you know, we're fortunate. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here in South Bend, 
but you know we're 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 it's a relatively i think um progressive place generally speaking and by that i simply mean that you can openly have these conversations um here and i think we need to continue to do that um and you know and i think that I'm often not quite sure what to tell white people what to do. Um, I think white people need to be having that conversation with each other, <laughs> you know, to a, a large extent. Um, but I but I believe firmly that any significant change that's going to happen in this country is going to happen through multi in multiracial organizing. Um, black people didn't create racism; we can't get rid of it. White people, most white people exist living today didn't own slaves, didn't participate in, in those systems and structures, but they benefit from it and what then carries a certain responsibility in changing it. Um, but we gotta find a way to do that together. But black people shouldn't be leaned on um, to lead it always. Yeah, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, and that is, do you think this conversation regarding critical race theory and lack of discussion, discussing these important topics in schools will continue to impact the constant disparity of sentencing and mass incarceration of black men and women and other minorities? Can you read the first part of that? I'm just going to connect mass yeah. incarceration with schools. Yeah. This is, do you think this conversation regarding critical race theory um, uh, will discussing these topics in school, so discussing critical race theory in school, will continue to impact um, mass incarceration of Black men and women. Yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, big reactions to critical race theory is the, the allegation that is taught in the schools, and the, but it's not. So the critical race theory doesn't happen, at least in K through 12. Um, that's not where critical race theory is being discussed. I mean, you can ask any teacher, any principal, any superintendent, and they'll be like, yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> um, I got a 14 year old. I don't talk to my 14 year old about critical race theory. Um, it's generally taught in colleges and universities, but that doesn't mean that we can we, we cannot and should not be teaching race and the history of race in schools. And we should start teaching that history in kindergarten and not, in any heavy handed way, and it all needs to be age appropriate, of course, but 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 kids need to be young people need to be um, told the full history of the world they live in. Um, you know, I'm sure you most many of us professors um, when, I, when I teach history, I, you know, inevitably there are students in my class. These are college kids who are outraged that they don't know this history yet um you know and it's like you know the the, the question is like why did, why wasn't i taught this before why am i just encountering this for the first time and that's that's part of the the the, the problem with how we don't talk about race and we need to talk about that in schools and to the extent it can and will affect mass incarceration i think that the more educated we are and understanding race and understanding the, the inequities of application of laws along racial lines can have an effect um, on policies, on sentencing, on, on a whole range of uh, contributors to mass incarceration. Um, but, but ultimately, I think what will impact things like mass incarceration, like the criminalization of Black people and Black bodies, is creating new, um, broader, and a more equitable society in terms of opportunities and jobs and healthcare and housing, that we really have to address those underlying structural barriers um, that are really the places where white supremacy continues to be embedded um, and uprooting that. Um, that. Those are the factors that and forces that will um, change the carceral system because then we need to change policing we need to change the the sentencing and courts and um we need more diversity within the bench you know all all of those are critical and i think they're all grounded in beginning to teach 
the full history of this country, you know, in elementary, middle, and high school. Again, in age appropriate ways, but not whitewashing any of it. Um, and kids will appreciate that and they'll be better human beings for it. So I just want to, we, we have plenty more questions. Um, and I just want to remind you, uh, it's easier for me to find questions if you put them in the Q&A instead of the chat. But feel free, if you want to keep chatting, that's fine. Um, but uh, here's another question. How is critical race theory being leveraged to respond to environmental injustice? It seems like a good fit to create an understanding of the foundational elements that have led to the issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think environmental injustice really, again, has deep structural roots to, to its production. Um, you know, I mean, it's, again, staying local here, it, it, it's not um, surprising given the racial history of this country and of Indiana and of South Bend, um, that, you know, during the Great Migration, the Black neighborhood, the residentially segregated Black community was put near a toxic waste dump. Um, you know, that, that that kind of environmental injustice or that what we find is that many highway systems in, in major cities cut right through the heart of vibrant Black communities um, under the name of urban renewal um, and then created all kinds of wreck, all kinds of havoc because then they begin placing, you know, incinerators and, and other um, environmentally damaging um, parts of the town in the in those communities. And so yeah, that, that kind of analysis and um, study the critical race theory, critical race history, um, and the methodology that it has can allow us to look at those in, the, in a different way, in a deeper way, and kind of through a, a lens that can really begin um, exposing the historical production of it and the legal and structural maintenance of it as well. Okay, so the next question is, do you see any evidence of the discussion of critical race theory being becoming any less inflammatory than say six months ago? <laughs> well, 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 we'll see how the next election cycle goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that what we're gonna find to some extent given the direction that things are going, that um, those on the right are going to continue to try to use critical race theory and things like that as a boogeyman to drum up their base. Um, so I think that what we might find is it gets more intense before it gets better, um, just because of how politics have entered into it all and the partisanship that we're experiencing. And, you know, for better or worse, those on the right have found it to be a use, the kind of misinformation, the kind of distortions have been a useful organizing tool. Um, and, they, and again, that's part of why we need to continue to speak out about it in a much more forthright and truthful manner and a much more accurate um, so that we can have those conversations and dispel that misinformation. Now we have a personal question for you, Daryl. Sure. Um, <laughs> have you been able to use the 1691 project to talk to your son about racism in American history? Yeah, oh, it's a good question. Yes, I have. Um, you know, my 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 14 year old who's coming this weekend. Um, he, we we have lots of little chats. I mean, I don't impose stuff on him. I mean, I, I talk to him to the extent he that he's open to it, but he's biracial. And so, you know, he, you know, he's really sensitive around issues of race. Um, his mom is from Spain. Um, and so, you know, we do talk about, we, we, we talked about, for example, um, we, we both read together um, Ibrahim Kendi's Stem from the Beginning, the, 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 one, the book for children, for young adults. Um, so we, we do the kind of collective reading and discussions. Um, but more as we do as much watching soccer on TV as we do talking about that though. <laughs> Hope you meet a gal. 
sorry. So to up, upgrade from the past, do you think that changing the language that is spoken towards those who are non-white, such as the minority, um, do, they, do you think, um, let's see, so what do you think about trying to remove the word minority from our vocabulary? Would that be useful? Um, I don't know. I mean, what do the things they do? I, I personally don't have a problem with the word minority. I mean, minority, majority. I mean, um, and, you know, particularly, you know, after 2040 or 2050, when white folk are going to be the minority, you know, we'll, we'll see how that word gets used then. Um, if it becomes, you know, as something to, to, to use. But related to that, I, I do believe, and this is why I, I kind of very, you know, consciously you know, talked about white supremacy, because I, I think that we do have to label things for what they are um, and not try to cover them over with euphemisms or, you know, sl slide by them. We need to face this. We need to look at things head on, honestly, clear eyed and, you know, unflinchingly. Um, because not doing that is what God is here. And the only way that we can change that is really, is, I think it's kind of, I try to communicate at the end of that talk is that we have to own it. We have to own that, all of it. And we have to own it by calling it what it is as part of that process. So I think we have time for uh, one more question. And that is, uh, can black and brown families use HB 1134 our children are made uncomfortable by the teachings that Daryl used as examples in his opening. What do you believe that multiple lawsuits of this manner would do to the legislation? Can you just rephrase that? Read that one more time, yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, can black and brown families use HB 1134? Um, our children are made uncomfortable by the teachings that Daryl used as examples in his opening. What do you believe that multiple lawsuits of this manner would do to the legislation? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the things, if I, if I understand the question right, one of the, one of the um, things that we're fighting here in Indiana is that it's such a super majority Republican um, legislature, in which means that they, kind of, they hold the power. Um, that that would be a good question for a lawyer, I think, but I'm not I'm not sure what what the what a lawsuit would be based on. Um, so if if that's I I personally think I'm 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 along the lines of Malcolm, by any means necessary. <laughs> if 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 we can find purchase and traction through that, then absolutely you, we we should give that a shot. I'm just not sure that it. I'm not sure exactly how that will work out, though. Okay, right. well, I'm going to turn so it over much. to Stephanie. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Gail. And thank you, um, Daryl. This um, was really incredible. Um, this is a series, and uh, we have two more coming up, March 24th and April 21st. Um, we have Dr. Andrea Rusnak um, speaking on the political power of needlework, which sounds incredibly interesting. And uh, then um, Kristen Quimby, Dr. Kristen Quimby um, speaking on April 21st about preventing a zombie apocalypse. So um, I very much appreciate you guys coming tonight. I uh, hope you were able to, to stay warm and snug inside while you listen to this amazing talk. Um, if you want to learn more about these upcoming talks, I would suggest following us on social media. If you want to catch up on previous lectures, you can also find our um, previous lectures, recordings of those on YouTube. Um, you could just Google IUSB pop up. Um, we're going to www.iusb um edu slash community dash engagement i will put that in the chat um and uh yeah i just really appreciate uh again dr heller um your engagement in the community and your willingness to be here tonight so thanks again everyone join us um in march and april have a good evening all right thank you stephanie and thank you gail